Hello everyone, and welcome to the Manure and Mod Management webinar. My name is Masoud Hashemi. I'm an extension professor in the Stockbridge School of Agriculture, and also I'm serving as team leader for crops, dairy, livestock, equine of UMass Extension. Today, we are going to talk about two major issues um, that horse farms are usually confronting. Um, one of them is manure and the other one is mud. And of course, I need to emphasize that this presentation is an introductory level. So if you have specific questions about your operation, I encourage you to conduct me, uh, to contact me um, by email or by phone, and I'll be glad to assist you. Before I start, I would like to thank Mass Massachusetts Department of uh, Environmental Protection and EPA for providing funding to us so we can work with horse farms. And my sincere thank goes to Hampton Hampshire Conservation District, which initiated this presentation. So today's talk is about um, First of all, let's start with the non-point source pollution and define what that really means. And then we're talking about manure management, both in the barn and the manure left on the pasture. And finally, we're, we're gonna talk a, a little bit about mud management, and how the mud create at the farm and how we can minimize it, okay? So, in terms of non-point source pollution, uh, as you know, when water moves either on the soil surface or it goes deep into the soil, it picks up and carries pollutants, all kinds of pollutants, uh, such as nutrients and pathogens. And these, uh, these are major pollutants and we don't know where the source is. It's really hard to, uh, to identify the source. And that's why it is called non-point source pollution. It could be, uh, the source could be a, a few miles away from a water body and still you see such, a, uh, such an ugly situation as you can see, it's a blue, uh, it's an algae bloom and turned a beautiful pond into this greenish ugly situation. And usually uh, the reason for that is that the first candidate for making this uh, greenish situation is phosphorus. And, um, and then the second candidate would be nitrogen. Um, then the question would be, um, what's got manure to do with the non-point uh, non source pollution? Well, it's got everything with it because uh, there is nutrients in the manure, all kinds of nutrients from macronutrients, micronutrients. It is especially very rich in phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, but also it, it, it is rich in pathogens, all kinds of pathogens. And when these guys, when these nutrients or pathogens or uh, manure particles get into the water through uh, either runoff or leaching, then in, the problem starts. So we have to manage the manure um, and uh, we have to do it because uh, to prevent uh, all kinds of contamination, whether it's a surface water contamination or groundwater contamination. And the picture that I'm showing is actually uh, is a brook right behind a dairy farm. And as you can see, the leachate coming and runoff from the manure pile uh, got into this brook and turned this brook water into such a brownish, ugly situation, right? And also we have to manage manure because of to protect animals' health and um, odor is another, offensive odor is another uh, consequence of unmanaged manure and also, um, 
we, we want to preserve the nutrients in the manure so we can use it as a valuable source of nutrients instead of buying fertilizer. So I hope you convinced that the manure must be managed. Now, the nutrients in the manure can be lost to the environment, whether, whether to soil, water, or air in, a, in different ways. Uh, the, 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 probably the most common would be runoff. And among all the nutrients in the manure, phosphorus tends to be lost from manure through runoff and gets into the surface water and cause, uh, for example, the algae bloom that I just mentioned. But other ways to lose the nutrients are leaching. Usually nitrogen is lost from manure through leaching. It goes down and got down and down and eventually gets into the uh, underground water, including the well water. Uh, volatilization of ammonia is something that happens all the time. Whenever we smell manure, that's actually ammonia that comes out of the manure. And I usually say it's money in the air. And this is the nitrate, which is not only is a loss of money, but also pollutes the environment. And also the nit uh, nitrogen can be lost from the manure through denitrification. So I don't want to get into uh, the process, but I just want to emphasize that the nutrients of the manure can easily be lost to the environment, especially if, if, if they are not well managed. Now, if, manure gets into the water in any ways, then it causes all kinds of problems. Uh, for example, these are just a few examples. For instance, the nitrate, nitrogen in the manure, it gets into the water it, uh, and somebody, especially the, the young kids or young animals, drink from that water, it causes blue baby syndrome and also it causes cancer. Uh, ammonia nitrogen in the manure, if it gets into the water, it kills the fish. Uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, as I said before, they cause algae bloom. The pathogens, of course, they, they cause uh, some health issues. And the organic particles in the manure, if it gets into the water, they deplete the oxygen and therefore the marine uh, animals such as, um, you know, snappers or um, the fish or frogs and that sort of things will die because of the lack of enough oxygen. So as you can see, if manure gets into the water, it causes all kinds of problems. So what can we do? Well, if you have animals, horse, doesn't matter, horse, sheep, goat, beef, you got manure, right? And horses are specifically is, is important because they generate not only relatively large volume of waste because they are huge compared to sheep or goats, but also because of the bedding that we usually use and it, it's the soil bedding plus manure that we usually call it waste, that is a huge, um, huge amount. As you can see the picture in, in up here, shows that um, you know the manure the manure plus the bedding and um, piled in very short period of time and also in the bottom photo uh, it shows that this is the manure that uh, is accumulated uh, within less than a month and as you can see uh, the leachate and runoff from the manure um, is is on the ground and eventually it gets into the water body whether it's a brook, it's a, it's a pond or it's a lake or something. And as I said, the waste accumulates at no time. So we, we are facing with a large amount of manure. Uh, the question is how much manure? Well, it depends if it's we're talking about in the barn because the amount of accumulated manure in the barn is totally different than the amount of manure on pasture. So let's talk about the manure waste in the barn. Um, to give you a hint, 62 pounds of manure, horse manure, raw manure is, occupies about one cubic feet. 
and on the other hand, about nine to 12 pounds of sawdust or wood chips uh, or wood shaving, that is also occupies once one cubic feet. So having those numbers in mind, a horse, a standard size horse, which is roughly about thousand pounds in the, and it usually poops about eight to 10 times a day, uh, in total, it produces, it generates about 45 pounds of manure per day. This is raw manure again. And con considering those numbers that I gave you at the top, that translates into 0.7 cubic feet of uh, manure. Then, of course, we have biddings uh, on average, um, anywhere between 8 to 15 pounds per day, uh, all kinds of biddings. Which, um, which again occupies about 1.3 cubic feet. So in one day, we are dealing with two cubic feet of waste, okay? Now, if you multiply that by 365 days, if you keep the, if you keep the animals in the barn year round, then you, you end up with the 730 cubic feet. And that is, uh, enough to occupy a storage which is 12 feet by 10 feet and then six feet height. That's huge. Of course, you're not going to have 730 feet, cubic feet because the animals will be outside uh, for, the, for a period of time. Uh, but it, potentially a, a horse can accumulate this much waste in, in a year. That's a lot. So now I want to show you something that the manure, uh, horse manure is a good fertilizer. So if you look at this column, it tells you the different animals, different types of animals produce different amount of manure. Horse, as I said, is 45 pounds of manure. This is, again, this is raw manure without beddings. And if you look at the, uh, the nutrients in the manure, and you compare, I, I purposely turned those horse manure and beef cattle and the dairy cows into white so you can compare those three. And as you can see, the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in horse manure is, if it's not better than uh, dairy cow, it is pretty much the same. It has 12 pounds of nitrogen per ton. Per one ton of manure has 12 pounds of nitrogen, has five pounds of phosphorus, <laughs> of uh, five pounds of phosphorus and about nine pounds of potassium, okay? So that's, so it's really rich in nutrients. So yes, it's good if, if we manage it and we use it as a fertilizer, but it's bad if it gets lost into the environment. So the question is, if, if the horse manure is such a valuable source of nutrients, and the question is why horse manure is so unpopular. Nobody wants it. I mean, you can't even give it away for free. Um, so, the, so what makes it so unpopular? Um, as I said, the raw horse manure is as good as any other livestock manure. And you can use it directly to, to fertilize your plants. What makes it bad is the woody materials that we use as beddings and <clears throat> it, the woody materials again could be sawdust, could be wood, wood chips, could be uh, wood shavings, could be wood pallets, could be all kinds of woods. And why the woody materials makes uh, manure bad is because those woody materials are really rich in carbon. So they are basically consist of carbon and next to zero nitrogen. So. Uh, so when you add it to the soil, you're actually adding only carbon to the soil, no nitrogen. Now, when you do that, the soil microbes, they need carbon, and they are very happy that you add carbon to the soil because they need carbon for the energy, to make energy out of it. But they also need nitrogen to make proteins, okay? So the microbes are not like us that we we eat proteins, whether it's a meat or it's a legume, they need to make their own proteins. And in order to do that, they need nitrogen. So they need both carbon and nitrogen. 
And the question is how much? Well, ideally, the carbon to nitrogen ratio should be, um, my, the maximum should be 25 units of carbon to one unit of nitrogen. And if you have more nitrogen, that's even better. But a minimum acceptable uh, ratio of the carbon to nitrogen is 25 carbon to one nitrogen, okay? Now, if you look at some of these examples, for instance, different kinds of materials, agricultural soils is anywhere between eight to 14 to one. So that's good. Legume hay, 15 to 19 to one. It's good because it's less than 25 to one. Cow manure is good. Finished compost is good. But as you go down, the corn stalk, yeah, it's not really so good. But the corn stalk will be decomposed within a year or so and become available. But the rye straw is really bad compared to anything else. But if you think the raw rye straw is bad, then look at the sawdust. It's 500 to 1. So when you add woody materials to, to manure, you're actually, you, um, the, the carbon nitrogen ratio is not acceptable. And when you add something like that to the soil, the microbes happy, they get enough carbon, but they get nitrogen from the soil because the, they actually, they compete with the root of the plants and they are much, much, much stronger competitor. They get nitrogen from the soil and they leave nothing for the plant. And therefore plant gets stunted, yellow, and finally die. And that's why nobody wants, they tried it. They tried horse, the horse waste and they spread it on the lawn. They spread it on the vegetable garden and it killed their plants and say enough is enough. They don't want it. So what can we do? Well, the only option that we have with the manure or waste that we collect from the barn is composting, okay? Now, so the barn manure management is, has several steps. As you know, first of all, you have to collect it from the stalls and then you have to store it somewhere and then you have to treat it. That's the only option you have. You have to compost it. Or you have to pay a, a big money to haul, a, haul away. And so it's totally up to you. And finally, yeah, once, the, once, the, once the, uh, the compost is finished and ready to be used, you, you apply it to the land. It could be a vegetable garden or could be pasture. And finally, the last step in barn manure management is, uh, is controlling nuisance, mostly flies. Okay, so those are, when we're talking about manure management, manure management in the barn consists of those five major steps. Of course, in this, uh, in this talk, because of the limitation of time, we're not gonna talk about all of those things, but we, I am going to briefly touch on the, in these three uh, items or components of the barn manure management, storage, composting, and then land application. So the manure storage. Well, I, I've seen they store manure everywhere, but in in a <clears throat> in in a good way, the, the manure storage should be on a high ground, should be dry, and the maximum slope that you can have um, should be about four percent. Okay, and it shouldn't be on the paddocks. And I've seen a lot of horse farmers that they pile manure on their uh, pastures or in the paddocks, and th th those may cause some parasite issues, okay? And it's good that it's, a, it's vegetated, and therefore it prevents, it prevents to some degree, it prevents runoff, but at the same time, it causes some issues with the parasite. So it should be, at least about a hundred foot from wetlands. When I say wetlands, wells, drainage way, any water body. And also it should be far away from, uh, from neighbors. And, and this guy uh, just stored the manure next to the fence of the neighbor. So that's not really acceptable, okay? And the other important thing when you 
you know, about the storage is the covering. No matter how fancy your manure storage is, it has to be covered. And the covering cannot, can be very fancy and uh, some fixed uh, roof, or it could be just a tarp. Okay, I show you. This is a very good storage. The, the walls are concrete. Uh, the, the floor is compacted gravel, very good. And then this, uh, this lady has a tarp that uh, uh, covers the manure storage, covers from rainfall and covers from also from flies. So it's a good, good way to manage manure. Uh, this guy, again, on the pasture, but at least it, it has a cover. And uh, so that, that tarp, so covering is very important. And it could be fancy like this one. This is a permanent uh, roof and this shed or shelter can be used for different purposes, including storing manure. So how big the storage should be? Um, roughly for horse and cattle is about 72 square feet and that is enough for six months uh, per animal. So you figure out, you do the math, how, how many horse do you have or how many other livestock do you have? And so make sure that you have a, a big enough storage for, uh, for piling the manure, okay? Um, the flooring of the storage, um, this, this one is concrete, concrete walls and concrete floor. That's good. But guess what? It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a cover or it doesn't have a roof. So I don't recommend that. I wish um, they didn't pile it that high and therefore they could put at least a, a tarp on top. So the storage floor can be slightly sloped to one or both ends. This is because to prevent any accumulation of the water at the bottom. And options for flooring includes concrete, as I said, it's a fancy one, but it could be packed gravel, could be packed stone dust, could be compacted earth. And so it could be anything. Um, so. And finally, uh, the other barn manure management is composting. As I said, we left with only one option and that is composting. Um, and <clears throat> one thing that I should say it is just piling manure is not really composting, okay? And you, why is it not composting? Because by definition, composting is the breakdown of organic materials by microbial communities, okay? All kinds of microbes. It could be uh, the fungus are the major one, but also other than, other than um, fungus with the bacteria, actinomycetes and others, also they are play roles in composting. And, and like any other or living organisms, they need three things. They need food well there is plenty of food and also they need oxygen for respiration they also need proper amount of moisture and finally they need a proper temperature so if one of these is not there if it's too cold or if if the this carbon nitrogen ratio is not um a, a good or if the oxygen most of the time the oxygen is the limiting factor if the oxygen is not there enough for sufficient oxygen is not there to for all these microbes and therefore the compost will stop okay so that's why they usually turn the, the pile of the uh, composting materials and uh, but piling i mean turning is really uh, time consuming not everybody uh, has time to do it and uh, you know, the rule of thumb, the more turning, the better. Usually they recommend twice a week, but even once a week is too much. So unless you have a loader that you can turn the, uh, the pile, uh, it would be a very um, 
very problematic. Now, I want to talk about a little bit about aerated composting. So instead of an alternative to turning the manure by either by shovel or by loader, um, there are aerated composting, which means instead of turning, you actually insert oxygen into the pile. Okay, this is a three beans uh, composting, aerated composting. Uh, as you can see, there are number. Number one is fresh materials. So material fresh materials coming daily or every, every other day, and they are uh, go into the first bean. And the, the, the bean number two is halfway finished, and the number three just harvested, and it was finished compost, okay? Now, this is one of the beans. As you can see, the floor, there is a, there is a uh, perforated PVC pipe that's coming from outside and distributes like this, and it gives oxygen. So when the pump, air pump works, it gives air, and the air comes up. And then those boards will be covered the, uh, the pipes, the PVC pipes, like this. Okay? And there is also these two metals. Uh, it makes it very easy to insert the boards when you want to harvest the, uh, the manure or the compost, or if you want to add fresh materials, you can take out or put in those boards and it just slide in and it's very easy to do that. And finally, hopefully, you have beans full of composting materials and once you have that and it's full enough, then uh, this is the pump outside of the beans, next to the beans outside. The pump is not really big, it's one horsepower, uh, it's roughly about $100. Okay, and the pump it has uh, the pump has a timer. The timer works about roughly two minutes every hour. So it's not really con con continuously working. It only works for two minutes per hour, and it gives air, and the air goes through those uh, PVC pipe. I show you here. There are three three PVC pipes coming out, and if you look at the back of those three beans, you see the first pipe comes and then goes down and goes into the bottom of the first bean. The second one goes to the second bean and then gives air from the bottom to the second beer. And finally, the third um, composted uh, com uh, PVC pipe. And usually it takes about roughly about four weeks. It depends on several factors, of course. It depends on the type of materials, depends on, um, you know, oxygen timing or air timing, and also it depends on the air temperature. But roughly, it takes about four weeks uh, that materials turn into the compost, and then you need another week for, um, for finishing the compost. So all together is about five weeks. Okay, now uh, let's go back to, sorry, let's go back to this. Of course, this is, the system is very good, is kind of permanent. That means it's a one-time investment. And uh, so uh, how much is going to cost? Anywhere between 10000 to up to $20,000. And uh, so it's a one-time investment. Whether you afford it or not, that's totally up to you. But we, extension, UMass extension, we have offered a simple, low cost aerating system. And uh, in this case, so there are two types. We can use trash beans like this. Um, usually we, we, off, we usually recommend three trash beans like those. And uh, as you can, <clears throat> And uh, so, th as you can see, the bottom uh, make a hole, and then there is a pipe that goes in there, and the pipe will be attached to a blower, leaf blower. The leaf blower, again, is very cheap. The leaf blower is connected to a timer. The timer, exactly like 
the fancy one usually works about two minutes each hour. It could be an electric source, it could be uh, a solar, and uh, so it gives enough air to one being. Actually, it gives more than uh, more air that needed for one being. You can actually make it branch, and with one the leaf blower, you can actually send air to two bins. But again, those are very cheap, anywhere between fifty to sixty dollars, and they last very long. So some people rather to have one uh, leaf blower for each trash bins. In fact, the major cost of this system is the cost of the bins that they usually expensive about 300 350 dollars but again they last forever um now the other so those are the trash bins that they usually good for only one or two let's so go back these bins are usually hold about 750 pounds of waste so that is good only for one horse sometimes two horse uh, but if you have more than one horse, then you need a pile. So these perforated uh, PVC pipe, as you can see, uh, first of all, remember, these are pre-fabricated. So the holes are already there. And uh, I, did, I strongly suggest that you, uh, you get, if you decide to have this kind of system, uh, buy a PVC pipe that has two rows of, two rows of holes like those, because in this case, when the air comes, it would be like a V shape. Uh, so it actually goes into the all parts of the pile. And make sure that you end, um, you put a cap at the end. And this is just for demonstration, but if I, if I wanna do this, I usually make a groove into the, uh, to the soil and put the uh, PVC pipe in the groove. These are, um, the pile and as you can see there is a uh, one horsepower pump with the elbows uh, it attaches to that pipe it, the pipe could be 10 foot could be 20 foot could be 30 foot in this case it's a 20 foot but it could be even longer remember that this one horsepower it creates enough air for not only one but even two piles of 20 or even 30 uh, feet long piles, okay? Uh, so if you have another pile right here, if you have many horses and you wanna have two piles, um, then that's fine. You can actually uh, make it branch and um, send the air through the second. Now, for your information, we have step-by-step -step instruction for uh, trash bins, composting, aerated composting bins, and also for these pipe, uh, you can find it in our um, on our website, which is ag.umass.edu slash crops daily li livestock equine. And so the fact sheet is there um, with the pictures, step by step. And I, if I'm wrong, if I'm not wrong, I think even we gave the uh, the price of each uh, sections or each part. So, so that's another alternative to those fancy uh, aerated composting system. Now, how about manure in the pasture? I'm sure that you have seen this situation. Uh, and as you know, the horses will not uh, get, get in, in here because it uh, smells. So if it's urine and or feces like this, they're not gonna touch the grasses. So we gotta do something. And the, the only thing we can do is to remove manure from pastures. Uh, why we have to do that? Uh, first of all, because um, the, this manure in the pasture, it provides a right condition, a favorable condition for fly to reproduce, to lay eggs and also chances are that if we get a rainfall some of these manure may get into the water bodies so that's why we have to remove uh, manure from pastures how many how frequently usually uh, every year every day or 
every one to three days, okay? Now, we have to do that not only to prevent fly breeding, but also it's good for the animal's health and also it, it, uh, it controls mud and also minimizes the loss of the nutrients uh, through runoff, okay? Now, this raw manure that you collect from the pasture, you can use it directly. You can add it directly to your vegetable garden or shrubs or pastures directly with no problems. As I said before, the horse manure is bad when it is um, mixed with the uh, woody materials. So these are a few pictures that uh, I got uh, from, uh, from internet. And as you can see, there are, there is, uh, this is a cart that you can, um, you can pull it by ATV or a lawnmower and collecting manure. And these are very simple composting system and it's perforated, of course, uh, but it's not aerated. So there is no pump. It's just the air goes in there. And of course, it takes much longer. It takes much longer to have a finished compost. Okay. Now, the other thing that you need to do is harrowing the pasture is very important uh, to break up manure clumps. And um, it could be anything. It could be just that some, uh, some chains behind, uh, some chains or tires behind the tractor, or there are a little bit more fancy like this, but we have to do it and we have to do it frequently. I would say uh, definitely um, not longer than uh, once a week. Okay, and you have to do it because, and if, when you add manure to the pastures, make sure that you spread it in a thin layer, okay? Because of this, uh, because the flies do not lay eggs in, uh, in thin layers. Usually flies lay eggs when the manure is about four to five inches, at least four to five inches high. So if you, if you spread the manure in thin layer, they usually don't lay eggs in there. So that was that for manure management. Um, and as I said, it's just an introductory level. Um, I'm sure that you have some specific questions about manure management in your operation. And as I said, please send me an email and I will be glad to help you out. Now about the mud management and the very first question that I have for you, just look at this. You have two, two extreme situations. You have the beautiful green grasses right on the other side of the fence. And then you have this muddy situation inside. And the question is why? I mean, they were the same. Why it turned into such an ugly situation? Mud, which is bad for the environment, but even more so is bad for the animal. So issues with the mud is not only is an unpleasant view like this, and I'm sure you have experienced this kind of view. Um, and it is also a serious source of pollution, okay? Um, it takes only one severe rainfall that takes a big portion of those uh, mud into um, into a water body. It creates, it creates unsafe footing and when it dries, it turns into dust, which is bad for neighbors, for us, and for the animals. And also it increases the fly breeding areas. So how mud creates? Well, the very number one candidate for making mud in our farm is overgrazing. Okay? And also when we let the animals to have access to wet soil or wet pastures, that also um, is another reason for creating mud. Soil compaction, especially in a high traffic areas, is another reason for seeing mud in our operation. Runoff rainwater from barns and shelter roof, that's another reason. And finally, 
if we have so much organic matter, such as hay on the ground or manure, that sort of thing, those are also like sponge. They hold the water and they don't let it go. So those are the major reasons for uh, having mud in our operation. Let me show you this. Um, this is a mid-sized paddocks, right? And it's in the spring. Yeah, I know there is a still, there is a still snow in there. Uh, and just by looking at these paddocks, I can see, I can identify several issues. The first issue is this. First of all, it was overgrazed. It was overgrazed in the previous fall, okay? So they let the animals to graze all the way down to the soil. And now in the spring, instead of seeing a green pasture, short, but green pasture, we don't see it, okay? And it usually takes about a month or two to see something comes out of the soil. So that's issue number one, overgraze. Issue number two, well, somebody drove into the paddocks. That's a no-no, okay? When the soil is wet, nothing, no equipment, no tractor, no ATV, nothing should be drove into the, should be driven, driven into the paddocks, okay? Number three, there's a compaction. And I want to show you the compaction is because you know that near the fence is very compacted because usually the horses get water or feed around the fences and therefore it's so compacted and therefore it shows the effect of compaction on muddy situation. The water is still there, okay? You don't see water in here because it's less compacted than in here. So. What about issue number four? Number four, this guy saw this mud and throw some hay and some woody materials, sawdust, everything to so-called dry this section. It actually uh, caused problem. The problem, the mud problem is going to be even worse. And this mud is not going to go away for a much longer period of time because these organic materials holds the water like sponge. And so adding some organic matter to a muddy situation like this is a no-no, okay? So you see, these are the major reasons, overgrazing, compacting the soil or driving into the soil and also adding some, not collecting manure from the pasture. These are all sources of uh, mud. Um, as you can see, this is a muddy situation. It's compacted. You still can see the water. It doesn't drain into the, into the soil because it's so compacted. And not only that, they actually, they feed the animals, those hay, they feed animals on the soil, which eventually, most of that will be part of the soil and therefore the organic matter of the soil is goes up and they holds the water and the muddy situation gets even worse okay now the question that i have for the farmer is why these horses are in this area in the first place there is nothing to graze right so why they are there uh so that's that's a question that i i try to answer in a minute but that's, that's the way it is. How do you like this? This is exactly the same. So let's go back. This is the same. So this is the same area when it was well managed. And that ugly situation, muddy situation, compacted manure, uh, hay on the ground, everything else has been turned into this beautiful green pastures, okay? and we will talk about it in a minute. So, one of the major source of mud is actually the water that comes from the roof of the barn or sheds. And just to give you a, an estimate, one inches rain, when it drops on a 30 to 100 foot, 30 feet by 100 feet roof, that translates into 2,000 gallons. Those are additional water coming 
to the soil from the roof. That's 2,000 gallons, okay? That's a lot of water and it's only from one inch. And chances are your barn is way more than 30 by 100 feet, right? And the problem is this water, it usually runs into the high traffic areas and eventually runs, runs off into the streams. So we must consider in order to minimize the mud formation, we have to consider uh, installing rain gutters, French drains like this, and downspouts like that. And the, the, the whole idea is to keep the clean water clean. The rainfall is clean and we have to keep it clean. In order to keep it clean, we have to uh, insert it into the soil, okay? So that clean water goes into the soil and it reaches the underground water. Or we can, with this uh, downspout, we can direct it into the uh, grassy areas, okay? Now, sacrifice areas uh, are important and it's part of the pasture management. I mean, I can't see a, a pasture management without having a sacrifice area, but also sacrifice areas are good for so many other things. Um, by definition, why we call it sacrifice areas is because you sacrifice a small area, something like 200 to 400 square foot per horse to save the rest of your pastures, okay? Great deal. This sacrifice areas um, is good to avoid overgrazing, especially if you have too many animals and not enough land. If you let the animals continuously graze, of course they overgraze it. And of course, overgrazed area turn into the mud. So sacrifice areas is a good area. You remember that I showed you why these horses are in that area in the first place. Some, some people will say, well, horses, they want to run, they want to walk, they want to social, they want to have fresh air. Yes, but at what cost? They're going to ruin the pasture. So you can keep the animals in sacrifice areas. They have social, they can walk, they also, they have fresh air without ruining the pastures, right? So the sacrifice areas is the fundamental uh, part of each animal operation, especially horse farms. And also sometimes you wanna keep the animals in the sacrifice areas to control their forage consumption. And this is especially important when the horses become obese and in order to, um, to prevent obesity, we have to keep them for some time, for some period in the sacrifice areas and only let the animals to be on pasture for a certain period of time. And also it's to avoid compaction. When the pasture is wet, when the soil is wet, as I showed you, you don't want to let the a thousand pounds animals get into that because it, it compacts the soil and the compact soil simply means um, mud condition. So, it, so when the pasture and soil is wet, we want to keep the animals in sacrifice areas until it, they get dry. And also sometimes during the year, especially during the month of July and August, uh, we call it summer slump, the pasture is not growing actively. So if we continue, let the animals to be outside while the, while the plants are not growing actively, they overgraze it, okay? And uh, so in order to prevent such a situation, we have to keep the animals in the sacrifice areas and limit their access to the pasture to only a couple of hours. <coughs> and sometimes the sacrifice areas become handy. We can keep the animals in there when we wanna apply some chemicals such as lime. <coughs> so, <coughs> Excuse me. So, how we can um, how can how we can establish a sacrifice area? In general, you can scrape 
you can you should scrape the land for uh, well <coughs> excuse me uh, you ha you have to scrape the land uh, whatever size you have about 12 inches and when you scrape it then you can put some large gravels in there okay we call it soft base and uh, is large gravels and then on top of the large gravels you put what we call a geotextile fabric okay those black layers of clothing we can put that so that cloth prevents mixing the the above layers with the below layers and then on top of the geotextile fabric you put anywhere between three to four inches or five inches of smaller gravel okay and then at the top about anywhere between two to three inches you put what we call it footing materials now footing materials could be anything uh, remember that first of all before i talk about the footing materials uh, remember that uh, the, it, it's it's very highly recommended that you surround your sacrifice areas any confinement areas with a vegetated buffer okay and now back to the footing materials it could be um, it could be anything it could be wood chips which i don't like it it could be uh, stone dust it could be compacted gravel it could be there are all kinds of footing materials now again there is a fact sheet and if you go to our website and you can see footing materials you you see the, in, the instruction for making uh, making sacrifice areas the type of the footing materials and also the cost uh, this is just one picture as you can see here uh, this is in Hadley horse farm and uh, so we have wood chips one wood chips with geotextile fabric one area wood chips uh, without so we can this is for education okay and so we knew that without geotextile fabric is not going to work but we have to show it we have to document it to students and whoever comes to visit the farm and also we have compacted uh, compacted gravels with again with um, geotextile fabric or without and then we have a stone dust and then there are some other materials and uh, if you if you are living around here you're very welcome to go to Hadley Horse Farm and you will see uh, several kinds of um, footing materials and you can um, you can see it now uh, this is wood chips again wood chips plus geotext textile uh, the size is 60 by 40. Hey, this is this is my mistake. Okay, please forgive me for my mistake. This this should be 2400. I typed is the typo is 4200. So it's 2400 square foot. That is a lot. That's big because if you remember, for each horse you need anywhere between 200 to 400. So 2400 is good at least for six horses. Or five horses okay so that's uh, 4200 20 of uh, 2400 the square is good for four uh, four five horses the materials these are the cost the roll of geotextile fabric cost you 445 and the chips anywhere between 12 to 15 you don't have to buy uh, you know the very fine and very uh, you know top quality wood chips 12 to 15 um per yard and the cost is 2300 again this is uh, this is uh, for several horses and the labor that includes um, if you take the labor if you not doing it yourself you have to hire someone to do that if you don't have the machine so you can add another 750 dollars it sums up to about three thousand dollars not really bad huh so if we look into this one, it's crushed gravel plus geotextile. And again, it's, it sums up to about 3,500. And this is the probably the best one, gravel plus stone dust plus geotextile. And as you can see, it's 3,600. 3,600 for four, five, six horses is not really bad. 
and knowing that this sacrifice area can save your pasture is a really, really cheap investment, okay? So, the other, there are, there are a little things that you can do, for instance, look at this one. I mean, um, this is the water container, and as you can see, because it's a high traffic area, the horses coming for water, and they coming all the time, and look at this, they turn this pasture into a muddy situation. I mean, it's not mud now, but with one rainfall, it turns into the mud. And the mud extends itself. And so by rotating, um, by rotating watering can, or in this case, look at this, as you can see, it's a feeding uh, areas, and it turned it into this. And so by rotating uh, the feed and water con <coughs> containers, you can avoid or can, you can minimize, to some extent you can control the mud in the pastures, okay? So, as I said, it's, it's a great idea to have a vegetated buffer around paddocks, sacrifice areas, any confinement areas. These, these are good because they catch, whenever we have rainfall, they catch nutrients, okay? And the grasses like this can be grazed by animals, or you can plant flowers, you can plant shrubs, trees, Christmas trees, whatever you want, and you can actually, you can use it or you can even sell it, okay? So it doesn't have to be grass. And finally, another kind of innovative idea for pasture management and mud management is pasture paradise, okay? So this horse, uh, they, they, they had 40 horses, and only eight acres. And of course, as you know, 40 horses is way, way more than, um, they need more than eight acres, okay? And uh, you remember, I showed you that um, muddy, bare, sore condition. So this is what we came up. This is a very simple, simple method of preventing uh, that situation. So the, Pasture paradise simply means you're actually creating a track all around the, all around your cent central pasture. The width of this track could be anywhere between 10 to 12 feet. And so the horses can walk, they can, they can run. And so you can put um, feed and water several places so they actually move from one stop to another to get feed or to get water and so they walk and usually one if one horse starts to running other horses start to to follow it and so they get social they get a fresh air they do their natural habitat which is running and walking but they're not ruining this pasture this pasture was just established, is just receded, okay, and it turned into this. And so the horses are walking around, and this central pasture was divided with those um, temporary fencing, and depends on the number of animals, depends on the time of the year, uh, you, can, uh, you can assign um, part of these pastures to several animals for several hours. I can't tell you one hour, two hour, or three hours. It could be more, it could be less. But when you don't have enough land, you can't really force uh, the land to produce enough food or feed for your animals. You have to do something. You have to sacrifice something. Okay? And uh, so the pasture paradise it is a very simple, it's not very expensive uh, idea to implement and that can really help to prevent mud, but at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a nice view. Okay, so I guess with that, I should say thank you for listening. And, um, and if, you have, if some of you have questions, then I'll be around to answer. Thank you. So whoever wants to ask question, you can unmute yourself and question.
I have a question. Sure. This, this is Diane. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you are spreading the manure on the pasture. Yeah. And uh, is I always thought that might be a problem for spreading uh, parasite eggs. Well, I didn't spread, sorry, I didn't spread manure, I spread it compost. <coughs> Oh, okay. okay. When you said to harrow the pasture. Okay. Yes. For harrowing the pasture, you are spreading. You're actually, the, the manure is already there. Right. And it's dried, right? And then you're using chain, you harrow it, mm -hmm. and you make it a very thin layer. And uh, usually that takes care of the parasite and also flies. And also it uniformly spread the nutrients more uniformly um, yeah okay and the horses will eat the grass well if you give it a few days yes okay while i'm uh, asking a question i have uh, one more question of course which is um any medicines that a horse might have or a dewormer or parasite eggs in the composted manure um, well, it, that's a very good question. If my general answer to this question is if compost is done um, and is finished uh, well, and because it, <clears throat> it creates a lot of heat, um, you know, usually if, if compost is done right, you should see that temperature with the long stem long stem thermometer, you should see somewhere around 140 40, um, degrees. And that heat usually takes care of parasites and other worms. It may not take care of the um, antibiotics, but it will take care of the worms. And uh, when I say worms, I, I really don't mean the, the good worms. I'm, uh, I'm talking about the parasites and also some pathogens. But if, if the compost is not finished well, that could be a source of problem. Yes, you're right. Okay, I'm wondering about how long the chemicals and dewormers might last and if that would affect um, mm. plants or anything if you're putting this on your garden. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. But unfortunately, I am not really expert on that. I really don't know. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, in using the perforated PVC pipes and laying yeah. them horizontally, what, what keeps the manure from stopping the holes up? Oh, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. We, we, did, we did it several times. The manure doesn't get into, the, into those holes. I promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you for doing this. This yep. is Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. On, hi there. On the pasture paradise, mm -hmm. the paddock paradise. Yep. Ideally, should the tracks be full of material like a sacrifice area? That's too expensive. Yeah, I would think so. so yeah. um, that's too expensive. They uh, turn but, into mud. Yeah, that's too expensive. I mean, um, if it's compacted earth, that would be okay. So if we could use some heavy rollers to compact the earth, uh, that makes it a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, okay. But remember that because it's surrounded with grasses, so there would be no runoff from those tracks, okay? Yes, it's unpleasant because it's muddy, um, but uh, just think about it. If it's not that, then the animals would be on a muddy situation anyways, right? It, you're not gonna keep them in the barn, so they would be in a pasture, so-called pasture, which is muddy. So it's better to be on the track, and the track is surrounded with grasses on both sides, and therefore, uh, and therefore, 
any nutrients, any runoff from those tracks will be captured by the grasses. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But again, if you have questions, if some question comes to your mind, and uh, please, please contact me. Um, uh, I already wrote my, um, my um, email. It's very simple, straightforward. It's masoud, M-A-S-O-U-D, at umass.edu. Uh, Irene, uh, my assistant, already recorded this. And also the other thing is, uh, if you need a, a PDF, PDF copy of my talk, I'll be happy. Just send your email and I will send a copy of my talk to you, okay? Um, I hope that works. And um, so with that, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.